down there. They didn't settle below the, uh, the flood plain. So in fact, when the flood came in Katrina, which wasn't the original you know, water problem, right? It was the breakage of the levee that caused it. So it's not the original storm surge. But if you, if you actually look at the pattern, the footprint, the areas which you all know and love and dear, right? The, the French Quarter, it wasn't destroyed at all. Because you know what? That area is above the sea level. It's all the areas on the side which they develop. So actually, New Orleans is a very viable city, just provided that it's much denser and a smaller region. But they actually spread it all out. That was a, a housing development issues that they did. Incentives, pay you to live here. Go ahead and live there. And by the way, you have to look at the reclaims. So it's perfectly rational for me to get flooded, go through all that horror, and then live there again because someone actually is paying for me to do this. If you, uh, uh, and so what we want to do is we want to look at these incentive issues and these information issues. The other issue is that if we have a good understanding of the economic system, remember bad methodology generates bad analytics, generates bad in interpretations, and that generates bad policy, flip that around. Good methodology, generates good analytics, generates good interpretations of history, and generates good public policy. So one of those things is the invisible hand proposition. The invisible hand proposition is a proposition in economics that goes all the way back to Adam Smith. It actually has roots much deeper than Adam Smith intellectually, but let's, we'll just stick with Adam Smith at the moment. And, uh, and the basic idea is that there's two orders in society. There is orders in which I can plan. I plan my family. I can plan my firm because I am a, I'm, you know, Bumper can plan the activities of the Future of Freedom Foundation because the sphere of influence in which the planner or the controller has over it is within their domain. But what you can't do is plan the entire economy as a whole which has multiple purposes. Here's the simple way to understand the differences between the two types of order. All right? In the one type of order, you can, in fact, be ends-related. I guarantee you, if you go and talk to Bumper, he has a mission. There's an end. Right? We're going to achieve this end. We have a mission statement. And we're going to organize our activities to achieve this end. And Bumper is personally responsible of whether or not the organization achieves that end or not. All right? So it, when push comes to shove, you have a responsibility to your donors that you are, in fact, living up to your mission. And if you don't, they stop giving, right? That's an ends-related relationship. But the U.S. economy as a whole, let alone the global economy, has no end, unified end. Instead, what the broader social order has is it's means related. Meaning the way in which we interact with one another to pursue a diversity of plans. All right? And so that's the different kind of order. And what the biggest problem in public policy is that, as you just saw, Right? We had a proliferation of plans. We have the Polson plan. We have the Dodd plan. We have, you know, uh, you know, this plan, that plan, and everyone's plan. Even today, when I was listening, they're like, we are going to, you know, when we implement this public policy, we are going to have to pick winners and losers. We are going to have to pick winners and losers. So the liquidationist, moi, okay, so if you read in history and look up that term liquidationist, they are, have particular scorn because supposedly we were the problem with the Hoover administration. Uh, by the way, the Secretary of the Treasurer, right, that, that, that uh, Hoover uh, uh, supposedly used, he was a liquidationist. This is factually wrong. I mean, the Hoover administration was extremely uh, interventionist. Uh, in fact, Steve Horowitz and I have an op-ed which we're circulating around right now about Hoover's so-called do-nothingness. Uh, program. Uh, FDR, by the way, ran on a balanced budget, uh, you know, in 1932. That's what he said he was going to do. I'm going to balance the budget. And, uh, and Hoover doubled the income tax in 1932. Uh, he also shut down all our ability to engage in markets and everything. So, 
Uh, it's not the case that it was a do-nothing strategy. But nevertheless, they're called liquidationists. So if you think about this, and you think about like the recent events and the issues of the bankruptcy, the problem is our current bankruptcy laws are so restrictive that it would tie up these things in forever. So one of the policies that actually does sort of make sense is the policy claims that were being made about the FDIC, that the FDIC get involved to ease the ability to engage in bankruptcy, right? A similar kind of thing would be a proactive government uh, policy during uh, a crisis situation like in, that we face with Katrina. Here'd be a policy for you. Eliminate all uh, occupational licensing restrictions. So, right? So what happened in Katrina was that they uh, did not relax the occupational licensing restrictions, unlike in Andrew in Florida, in which they did. So Joe and I are from New Jersey. We know lots of people from New Jersey who would go down there and make a lot of money if they could make $50,000 in two months to, you know, uh, hammer nails and do all kinds of things like that. But they didn't go. They went to Florida and Andrew, but they didn't go in New Orleans because they weren't allowed to work. Who was allowed to work in New Orleans? Well, you were allowed to push the waste off the street. So that's why Mexican workers came in and then did that to push the waste off the thing, but then no construction took place. All right, because we actually had a six-month waiting period. It's not very good public policy. If you're going to govern and, and look at things and say, how quickly are we coming back? Oh, by the way, you have a six-month waiting period. What I mean by that is I'm an electrician from New Jersey, and I go down to Louisiana. I have to wait six months for my license to be approved. So why would I go down? Profit opportunity is already gone. Okay? Um, and so that is a similar kind of thing here. If I'm going to ease the move of financial resources, then that's a very proactive device. That was one of the quote-unquote plans by the FDIC. But note what happens there. That's a means-related plan as opposed to an end-related plan, which is like the Polson plan. Polson is an end-related plan where he's actually going to be entrusted to pick winners and losers in the financial sector. All right? Think again about what I said about the ought and the can. Even if Polson could demonstrate that he ought to be doing this, the question then becomes, well, can he really pick winners and losers? Does he have that kind of detailed knowledge to be able to pick the winners and losers? Is he going to be able to pick the winners and losers in an objective and economic way? Or is he going to make that decision based on political connections and interest group logic? Okay? If it goes by political connections and interest group logic, the bill that you just signed, you didn't sign it, but we signed it in some metaphorical sense, of 700, well actually 850 billion, is going to be trillions before you know it. Because you know what? There's writers in there that say the automobile industry has a right to a bailout. And I'm pretty sure the state of Virginia is actually going to, you know, have a difficult time with higher education. So we professors have a right, I'm only making, you know, we have a right to bail out, you know, and we're all going to be protected or something. And so I think that we have, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a difficult uh, task here. Last little Austrian point that I'll make is that F.A. Hayek summed this position up by saying that the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. And uh, this is this whole issue of difference between ends-related and means-related planning. So, to sum up, in contrast to Tom Davies, economics is a science, but a unique science. It does have objective knowledge. There are things that you cannot accomplish. It's not just a matter of political will. You can have all the political will in the world, but you cannot plan an advanced industrial economy. Even if you want it to do so. So what are the main points from the Austrian school that are enduring? Or to put it another way, what are the main points from the Austrian school that still generate good economics rather than bad economics? There's a lot of bad economics. Even Sarah Palin the other day was talking about the economy heating up. I, I, you know, this is the thing that's hard. Students need to be clued into this, but it's hard for you to Bumper, when you were in school, Joe, when you were in school, right? It was a heyday in which market-oriented ideas and economics were at a, a low point when I started school. The belief was that the Soviet Union was not only more uh, moral, 
right? Because communism is a better idea than capitalism. 